Well, we are 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we're going to look today at problems at the potluck. Now, interestingly, today we've got a potluck dinner. Uh, but what we're going to see here, Paul, Paul is addressing problems that exist in the fellowship, which has been much of what we've looked at in, in 1 Corinthians. It's generally, there are difficulties, there's problems, and they're being they're being addressed, or, or he's trying to uh, address them. And so today, he's going to look at this problem that occurs in the fellowship. Now, a couple of important things here. And it is that when we read this text, chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, we, we look and we focus on the, um, uh, the, the Lord's Supper, the, 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 the communion meal. And, and I use this text every time that we do communion. I'll read elements of this. And so that, that becomes really a, a critical part of this. But, but we, we might get a little confused in the way that they conducted, the way it's described in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 compared to what we do. Because the communion meal, the Lord's Supper of, of uh, that day, was generally paired with uh, this other fellowship meal, the, this love feast where they would gather together and they would have everybody bring food. There'd be a big fellowship dinner. And as a part of that fellowship dinner, they would, they would do the Lord's Supper in, in conjunction with that. And so some things in this might confuse us a little bit if we don't understand that. But, but we're going to look at that today because there were problems that were occurring in the fellowship. And that is the, just the body of Christ that is the church. And those problems that were being carried over into the Lord's Supper, into the communion meal. And, and so, as a result of that, Paul's addressing those problems that existed first and the problems that were emanating from that in, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the Lord's Supper. And so, what we're going to look at today, really three things. We're going to look at, uh, at those problems that occur in an intimate fellowship. Now, I think this would be true in any aspect of your life where there tends to be this closeness, this this uh, intimate relationship exists. And so this could be in your workplace, uh, obviously in your, in your family, but, but anywhere where, where we're close together, we're sharing problems, where, where intimate relationships develop. And so that is creating, or, or maybe not creating, but it becomes a, an environment for these problems to exist. That's what happens here. So we're going to look at what we need to be on guard for as we... A function in an intimate fellowship. And I want to say this, I, we want this to be an intimate fellowship. The answer to the problems here is not to avoid intimacy. It's to guard yourself against these problems that emerge when you're in intimate fellowship with one another. So we begin with that, and then we look at how it affects the Lord's Supper. How it is impacting uh, people as they go to the Lord to, to, to participate in the communion time in the Lord's Supper. The, 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 uh, the remembrance of Christ and what he's done for us. And then finally, we're going to look at what is the reason for communion? What is the purpose in communion? And so, if you may, may be aware of this, but we were, uh, we were, last week would have been our normal communion time. But, but the fact that it, it that chapter 11, verses 17 through uh, 33 was going to be today. We, we thought it would be appropriate to move the communion uh, dinner to today. So, so today, at the end of the service, conclusion of our time here, we will be participating in communion. So three things here that we're going to really look at. One is the problems that occur in intimate fellowship, the problems that, or the effect that has, on our approach to the communion meal. And then finally, why are we even doing the communion meal? What's the reason behind that? So 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at 17, it says, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you. Now he says that for this reason. He has just commended them. He has just told them what a good job they're doing. He commended them for the, the, uh, the, how, how the women were wearing the head coverings and what that symbolized and how important that, that was. And now, he, and now he says, but in this area, now we got a problem. Now, much of 1 Corinthians has been that, hasn't it? Pretty much the, the majority of what he has spoken of has been in response to problems. And so he's, he says, what I'm about to talk to you about, I'm not commending you because there's a problem in this area. So here's what he says, because when you come together, 
It is not for the better, but for the worse. So there's problems that are occurring when they get together. Now you might say, well, that just sounds like my family. That sounds like dinner time at my house. And so why is that? Well, the truth is, if we are existing in intimate fellowship, it will be more abrasive. We will rub shoulders. We will have more problems than we do if we're existing in this kind of kind of peripheral, kind of remaining distant kind of relationship. If you just come in on Sunday morning and, and, and you're just in and out of here and you don't interact with other people, you just come in and get fed and, and leave, you are less likely to have problems with relationships. But if you get connected in the fellowship, it is more likely that you're going to have some difficulties. Why? Because, because we're broken, sinful people. Even though we're saved, we're broken, sinful people. We will never, ever ap live apart from that broken sinfulness until we are in heaven. And so we are carrying those problems with us as we come together in the fellowship. So in intimate fellowship, there will be abrasive occurrences in the way that we interact with other people. And so he says this, and I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are, uh, or I hear that there are, gen, there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. So here's the first problem that exists and will always exist in intimate fellowship. It's divisions. It's factions. It's problems. It's, it's we, we kind of we get with our team, we get with those that we're comfortable with, and we kind of stay in that place. I shared this in the, in the first service, that I could pretty much do a seating chart. I could pretty much stand up here without you being in here, and I could do a seating chart. Now, I would be totally thrown off today because Gerald and Betty are not in their seats. That would be a problem for me. But generally speaking, I could kind of I could kind of draw where you're going to be sitting when you come 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 in here, and I, I get that you you get in the place you're comfortable, you're around people that you're comfortable with, and, and now this is my seat, and 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 so, but that also produces this this kind of maybe uh, click where where those that we're with we're comfortable with those that we're with, and so we don't venture out into those that we're not comfortable with, and so I hang with my team. I'm comfortable here. I'm not going to venture beyond that. And so in that, or maybe in the ministry that you're involved in, if, you, if you're connected to the youth ministry, it can, it can be kind of cliquish in the youth ministry. And I'm not talking about the kids. I'm talking about the leaders. You, you, we, we, that happens because that's who we are as people. And so he warns us that divisions will occur in the church. We will get into places where we're going to have differing opinions and we're going to go in different directions because we want different things. And, and so he says this, though, somewhat surprising. He says, in some way, this is important, though, that there should be a distinction. There should be some, some factions. And he says, for this reason, so that we can tell whose are the true believers and those that aren't. In some way, the way that we divide amongst ourselves is a revelation of the reality of our salvation. And he sees that as important. Why is that important? Well, it's important that we know truly who are the followers of Jesus. And maybe more importantly, that we recognize those that are part of the fellowship who, who have not come to saving faith in Christ yet. And that doesn't mean we exclude them. doesn't mean we stop them from coming. But, but we need to understand and, and, and approach differently someone who does not have faith in Christ. And so, so Paul says there's a place for that. It's, that's an important element of, of church fellowship but you you've developed factions you've developed divisions that go beyond that and so as we engage in as we as we become part of an intimate uh, uh, relationship uh, there is going to be the tendency for people to be to be uh, to get clickish to gather together I remember going to church years ago and anyone who was in that church would say this, man, it's like a family. It's like a family. And I would agree with that. But you, but you know what? You know what? If you came from outside, you went into that church from outside, you know what you would say? Well, that's a family and I'm not part of it. it, it we, in, in our intimacy with one another, without intending to do it, Without ever even being aware of it, we have, we have kind of become a, a clique. We become the, this division, this, this, this faction that really would, would communicate to somebody on the outside that I don't really belong there. And so Paul's warning them that that, 
become, can oftentimes be the case in an intimate fellowship. He says, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat, for in eating, one goes ahead with his own meal. So again, this is that, that fellowship meal that would be conducted in conjunction with the Lord's Supper, the, the, the communion meal that we speak of. So they were coming together and they were having this kind of potluck dinner. Everybody would bring food. Now, generally, it was also seen as a charity meal in that not everybody had the ability to be able to bring food. So if you were able and you brought lots of food, uh, that w- was understood that there were going to be people that couldn't bring food and, that, and that, that was causing problems in the way they approached the meal. Now, I'm gonna, I want to say this. If today you didn't bring food, and, and not because you can't afford to, just simply you forgot to, or you didn't, didn't know today was a fellowship meal, we would, we would welcome you to the fellowship meal. We would, we would encourage you to be there because, because we always have lots of food at the fellowship meal. But what was happening at the fellowship meal was they were concerned about getting their own bellies filled. Here's what it says. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. And you're like, whoa, hold up. Drunk at the church fellowship meal? I know most of you are like, I didn't know there was alcohol available at the church fellowship meal. <laughs> and, and, and so in, this, in that time, that was part of the fellowship meal, and they were, they were abusing that. There was immoral actions taking place at the church fellowship meal. There were people who were, were worried simply about filling their own belly, and there were those that were engaged in immorality, in this case, getting drunk. And so there was this, this desire to have my own needs, my own passions, my own lust fulfilled. What, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. And so here was the problem. They were showing up at the fellowship meal and, and those who generally had lots of food were the ones that were getting in line first. Now, this is not a message to try to discourage you from getting in line first today. That's, that's not what, what we're talking about. But what it was was to make sure that I get so that I don't miss out on something. It would be like this, and I fully get this. I fully understand this. I'm standing in line at the church fellowship meal, and I look over on the table, and there are a dozen of June Herman's whoopie pies, right? And I count out, and there are 13 people in front of me. And I'm like, oh no, I'm, I'm sweating it. Am I going to get, so, so what's the answer? Well, I got I to gotta get to the front of the line. I got to get there before other people get there so they don't take my whoopie pie. And, and so that was kind of the, 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 the mindset that occurred in, in the church, in those fellowship meals. I want to get what I can get so I don't miss out on it. And that was affecting, that was affecting, that was having an effect on the, the, uh, the, the, the communion meal that followed. And here's what he says. And this is the part of the text that we usually just focus on. And it is when he begins to describe the actual Lord's Supper, the communion meal as we understand it. In verse, verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. Now, he is speaking on behalf, in the words of Jesus, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he's betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat with the bread and drink of the cup. And here's what was happening. All of that sinful arrogance, self-centeredness, immorality now was being carried over into the Lord's Supper. That now was affecting the way they approached God in terms of the communion meal, the communion elements. And so he says that that this is the problem. This this is causing problems for you in the church. And, And so he says this, make sure that you examine yourself. 
And so then he says this, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you who are weak and ill and some have died. And so what he's saying is this, that when we enter into this reverent communion fellowship meal experience and we are carrying with us all this junk, all this sin, this immorality that we looked at, that that is having an effect on the people who are participating in this. To this degree, some of them are sick and some of them have died. That's what he says. Now, we might look at the fact, well, you know, at least I didn't get drunk at the communion meal. We might look at that as some kind of, you know, positive, well, I'm not as bad as them. But regardless, unrepentant sin carried over into into the reverence of the communion meal has an impact on our life physically, spiritually, and even in this case, a description that some of them actually had died as a result of that. 